Hi, welcome back to the Lemoyne Center's uh, summer classes. And today I'm going to be teaching you a skill that, um, frankly, you can use from grade school all the way up into your PhD. Um, it's a basic skill, but it's one that I always emphasize in my classes because, in my opinion, it can be it can be the difference between failure and success. Um, I try to make the things I teach more than just information you can learn. Don't get me wrong, I like learning new information, but what really helps you in life is learning a new skill. And today, I'm going to talk to you about outlines. Alright, if you've already done an outline, um, that's great. I recommend that you continue doing it, especially in classes where you struggle. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to teach on this, um, Learning how to do an outline can be a very useful skill for you. All right. So, first of all, what is an outline? An outline is simply a simplified way of arranging information. That's a very complex, very, uh, as I could say, an almost tangent way of talking about it. But once you start getting into the habit of actually doing it, it's actually very simple. So here's how it works. So you say you've got an outline here, all right? Then you start with the Roman numeral I. This is the first thing. What is an outline? All right. It's a way of simplifying information. Okay. Um, when you learn a new skill, a new technique, a new method for approaching what's going on, one of the things you want to do is you're going to want to stop and write it down. Now, unfortunately, when you're in class, and I'm just as at fault as any other teacher about this, we tend to know our subject so well, we just zip all the way right through it and then try and get to the stuff that we really like. Okay. Therefore, when you're learning something new, um, a new way of writing, uh, themes and literature, uh, historical context to something, or if you're learning a new mathematic technique, or if you're learning something in biology that you don't quite understand, it's important to simplify the information you're hearing as best as you can. Um, it's, it's good to simplify it because then you can kind of take the basic building blocks of what you've learned and you can sort of readdress it. So an example of this was um, when I was teaching, I would often use outlines to hit the information I knew I wanted to hit on and then, if anyone got lost, I could simply go back to a note and say, well, this is what I mean by this outline. Alright, so this is The Red Scarf Girl. It's actually one of my, it was one of my favorite books when I was growing up. It's, it's so simple and so beautiful. I, I really recommend you read it. But um, one of the interesting things about Red Scarf Girl is that in order to really appreciate it, it the, the information's in there, but if you read the background information on what was happening in China at the time, it explains so much more of the context of what's going on. As an example, China, during between 1930 and 1950, started embarking on something called the Great Leap Forward. Now, depending upon who does the numbers on it, you'll find different answers on this, but the context behind the Great Leap Forward is as follows. China, for centuries, had been dynasties. Emperors ruling, ruling over years and years and years. Um, when World War II approached, China had fallen so far behind in terms of industry and in terms of world prominence that it began to collapse under itself. The empire started to die. And there was a war of ideas, as there always is when these things happen, over who was going to take over afterwards. As such, the winner of this particular conflict was the Chinese Communist Party which technically is still in charge today. Although, now they actually have a stock market, so how are you a communist when you have a stock market? I don't know. I don't judge. Um, but the important thing to learn here is that by learning some of the context before you go in helps to extract more of the information in it. But you don't want to have to write down every single thing I said. Even if you tried to, right now, behind your computer screen, and you said, well, I'm going I'm to catch up, I'm going to take away the whole thing. By the time you finish typing out one or two paragraphs, I've already moved on to the next point, and the point after the next point, and the point after that. So, even when you're trying to get the most accurate information possible, 
all you've done is fall behind. So by the time you start tuning in again and listen to what your teacher's telling you or whatever your source of information is at the moment, you will eventually, inevitably, fall behind yourself. So it's important to simplify it. Okay? It's also, it's not just simple, it's also swift. Now, some people in their outlines, in, um, I've noticed this with people who go to Bible college, they always alliterate. And yes, I do purposely use the word they. Always, always alliterate. So, it's simple, it's swift. Um, write down the information simply and quickly. Alright? The amount of helpful meat, let's call it. The stuff you really need to pass your class, the stuff you really need in order to get forward in life, actually tends to be kind of minimal. Um, as I study language, so obviously I know the stuff. But, you know, yeah, yeah, study out how much people talk versus how much they actually say. There's actually a lot, a big discrepancy there. So, when you write it down, make sure that you quickly get down just the stuff you need and cut right to the point. You don't need the pleasantries, you don't need to get it necessarily word for word. Um, I know some teachers insist that you get quotes word for word or that you get the correct year on it. Um, that's not something I like to do because it's like, well, you know, just because I don't get it word for word doesn't mean I don't understand the themes or uh, doesn't mean I don't understand the principles. So especially when you're learning things like biology or mathematics, it's important to write down swiftly. That way you can keep up to date on my class, on your class. Um, what else is it? It's simple, it's swift. <clears throat> It'll score you some points. Once more, I'll keep with the alliteration to make you feel better about yourselves. Yeah, it, 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 it helps you score um, better in classes. Uh, the other thing I say is that why do we do this? So that's going to be the next one. What and why do we do it? One of the reasons I recommend people doing out, do outlines is that um, they tend to do better in those classes. I understand that sometimes you walk into a class and you love the class, so you don't want to stop and write notes out. But it helps you because if you stop during a class and you actually write it out, you get more than the excitement of the class, you actually get the meat of the class and so that you can get a better grade. If you hate a class, and I know that some of you have probably a least favorite class, it still helps you because you're forcing your brain to focus on the subject. Um, Personally, I always excelled in language. Spoken word, written word. All right? I could get to the point where I was on my way to class, I would read the chapter, and I could immediately tell you what it was all about. Because that's how quickly my brain processes that information. On the other hand, there was a point where I picked up, um, a while ago I was bored, so I picked up a science notebook, and I read the same page like five times and I still wasn't getting it. So it's, it's whether or not you do the outline though, I recommend you do it because you'll tend to do better in both classes you enjoy and in classes you don't. Because when you don't enjoy a class, you tend to start tuning it out in your brain. That's not a conscious choice you've made. That's just your brain saying, no, just no. Um, and here I'm going to give you a little bit of advice about how to try and find some semblance of, of a better way of getting a good grade. Okay. No matter what you do, you're always going to run into something you don't enjoy. There's always going to be something that you have to do just because you have to do it. That's just life. Alright. One of the reasons I urge people to do an outline in their class is that it becomes sort of a cyclical problem. You go on this cycle, right? So you don't enjoy the class, so you don't want to pay attention. Because you don't want to pay attention in the class, then you do worse in the class, which means you enjoy the class less, which means you don't want to focus in the class. And you just go round and round on this wheel. One of the things I urge you to do is try and approach the class in a way that you want to do it. All right, so after I graduated from college, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, I came to notice that I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I went to my local library and I picked up a math book. 
I didn't like math, and my mother knew I didn't like math, and she asked me about it one time. I said, you know, I just want to see if I can do it. And here's what I noticed. When I chose to actually sit down and consider mathematic principles, that didn't make me good at math, but I got better at it because I wanted to get it done. I wanted to do it. I understand that there are always um, math problems or history questions. Um, I know that some people struggle with maybe gym or physical education. It can be a little frustrating to force yourself to do push-ups or to get through trigonometry or to write essays about things you don't understand. But by trying to apply yourself and say, okay, so one of the things that I'm going to urge you when you're doing your outlines is try to Try to think about how much better you want to do in that field. I mean, I understand that you're not going to enjoy every class you have. It'd be kind of odd if you did. But you should think about, if nothing else, the fact that you want to do well. I had a math professor in college, and I actually like this guy a lot, because one of the things that he, that he helped me with is to understand some of the context to the mathematical equations I was learning. He actually gave me the historical context. And once I understood how people arrived at those decisions, it became easier for me to understand how to do the actual mathematics itself because I understood their line of thinking. That's what helped me. Maybe something different will help you. Maybe instead of saying, well, I know why these people did this and therefore now I understand how to do it, maybe you're saying, I could care less about their personal background, but how does this function in the world around me? I've seen people do this too, where they sit down and they get bored and they're like, well, I, I wonder how to map this out. And then from that, they create something incredible. Now, there's something I'd like to show you is that another reason that, of why you should do it is you tend to act. Um, psychologists have, in fact, charted this out and they have come to the conclusion that if you write something down, you are therefore much more likely to act on it. So if you sit down and you think, oh man, I want to do my homework, and I want to ride my bike today, and I got to run the errands, if you actually sit down and make yourself a list, you're more likely to do it. Now there are, more, there are lots of reasons for this. One is that it helps you create it in order, which is another reason to do an outline. Sometimes it's better just because um, Simply writing it down shows you how small these problems are. I mean, I've been talking for about 10 minutes now, and realistically, I've, I've only had to write down a few lines here. So it's actually a very efficient way of looking at the world and viewing the world, and then as to making the world very simple. All right? Um, sometimes one of the issues that you run into isn't that the problems you're dealing with are hard. They just feel really overwhelming. You know, as you go back to school, hopefully in the fall, we'll see what happens, um, you know, that first day, so much gets dumped on you. I know that. You know, I remember when I would do my first day, one of the things I tried to do is I would sit the kids down and I would say, here's everything going on. And I knew, I knew that they had a lot going on in their life. So one of the things I did that day is, instead of trying to jump right into what I wanted to teach about, even though I was excited for the school year, even though I wanted to get it all done all at the same time, I took a moment and I stopped and I said, all right, here's a simple way of going through it. And I created an outline. That way they could follow my thoughts. I explained to them grading. I would write it all down right in front of them. You know what? Simply by writing down the things you have to handle can make it easier. Not that it's, it, it somehow renders the world different, but it shows you just how very few things you actually have to worry about. Now, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons I say why we create an outline. And you know, you can add your own. Um, another reason why we should do outlines is that uh, it tends to work. There's another one, you know, this is a tried and true way of, of figuring out what's going on. Um, frankly, this is more for people who are learning 
well, then people who are teaching, I'm so, I think I'm kind of an exception to the rule on this one, but um, generally speaking, I think that, that the data has shown that it, it really works for us as, as learners and as teachers too, occasionally. So that's sort of my outline. Um, I recommend you do your own, work it all out. So I'm going to do now a very swift outline on uh, the Red Scarf Girl. All right? Now, in order to show how quick and easy this is, I'm just going to pop open to a random part of the book and do a real quick outline there. That did not go the way I thought it was. I thought it was going to go so much smoother. Here we go. Alright, so, I need to get to the beginning of the chapter. So, if you're reading through this and you've never read it before, that's okay. It's going to read a little bit here and then we'll process through. The Red Successors. When Mom and Dad heard about the Daisy Bow, they immediately suggested that I stay home from school for a few days. Since there were no classes, other students were staying home too. No one would connect my absence with the Daisy Bow. Okay. What's going on? Outline. I. Alright. At this point, I'd say, uh, at the very top, we'll say, the Red Successor. Actually, it's Red Successors. So you put that at the top, all in bold. Red success. All right, it's fast, it's efficient, it gets my point across. Yeah, it works. All right, die, z, bow. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb, limb here and guess that you don't speak Chinese. So this is actually um, propaganda. So it's like creating a poster. But let's say that you're just starting out and you don't know that, so you say, alright, A, it's a political poster. Alright, B, another piece of information that's interesting here is that obviously whatever was written about her was very hurtful. I don't think I have to explain to any of you how something that someone writes or says, uh, even if they mean it in a quote unquote, purely political sense, can be very hurtful. So, hurt Jiang. Which is the name of our protagonist. Two. Another port, important uh, development in this chapter is that people stay home from school. So school. Ignore this next part because I'm going to go delving into it later. But, so, school's out, right? So, I know that in America we kind of have a very positive outlook on this. Hey, school's out, let's go home. Um, but I think after this quarantine, each of you has probably come to the conclusion that simply not being within a school building does not mean that all the issues of school disappears. You still have to learn, you still have to work hard, you still have to stay on top of your assignments, as difficult as that can be. Um, and the kids being home, obviously, uh, I think some of you have probably gotten a little frustrated with the things you've been going through. Um, me, personally, in order to learn, in order to really learn, I need to talk to the person that's doing it. So my process for learning is, first, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll try and get the information on my own. If I get frustrated, I like to go to the person who's teaching it. The best teachers I've always had have been able to sit down with me and walk me through the things I'm facing. Um, after that, I tend to learn then from doing it myself. So if I'm trying to new, learn a new skill like outlining, one of the things I like to do is I like to go to somebody who actually see if I can do it on my own. And this is a pretty simple thing, so I'm, I'm sure that most of you will be able to do it. But then to actually walk through and, and talk to somebody who actually does it. And then after that, just do it on my own. Um, so school's out, the kids are home, and uh, that's not really a sign of, of strength in a country. Bear in mind the context to Red Scarf Girl that I mentioned earlier. This is 
the Great Leap Forward, this is the Grand Revolution, you know, the countries in turmoil, and things that people usually rely on for consistency, like their governments and their homes, um, have been changed. So, um, let's talk about themes here. Now, for those of you who struggle in English class, and I know that a lot of you do exist, your teachers will always try and hammer home what a theme is. And, in a way, by having to tell someone what a passage is about, you kind of render it pointless. You know? Like if I said, oh, this passage is about chaos. That's what I personally wrote down. Okay, that doesn't actually teach you what chaos is. I think it's better than to try to approach it from the lives you're living now. Okay. School let out. You all went home. You're all remoting. Okay. I respect your teacher's approach on this. I do. I have a lot of friends in the business. I bump into people online who are teachers. And I assure you, it's not much easier on the other end of the spectrum either. You think it's hard sitting home, reading through an assignment and doing it and submitting it through cyber? It can be for a lot of people, but it can also be very difficult when you're used to this form of conventional teaching where you're in a classroom and you're teaching people. And then all of a sudden you look out and then you have to do, you have to convert it all into electronic format. So, like, I like writing things down, physically actually writing it down, and then going through piece by piece. But then you have to type it all down, and then you have to submit it online, and then you have to make sure the portal's working. Then you have to try and do attendance, and on and on and on and on. My, my, my point to you is that when you have change, rapid change within the system, it would be very difficult for people to stay on top of it. And chaos to human beings is simply unbearable. We like a nice, predictable lifestyle. Right? The sun rises, the sun sets. Right? It rains, and then the rains go up again. It's a nice, predictable cycle. Once you institute just a little bit of unpredictability into it, that's where things can get a little stir-crazy. When you change the way that people think and act, it can be good, it can be really good, but it can also mean that people take advantage. And, as for the background about the Dizzy Bell, that's what happened with poor Jayane is that someone, an anonymous author, just decided to slander her. Well, how is that okay? I mean, think about it. You know, you're in school yourself. If you went and you wrote something nasty about somebody else, and the principal found out, you can be written up, you can be suspended, you can get in trouble with your teachers, in trouble with your parents. But when someone slanders you secretly, they write down something nasty on a bathroom wall, they spread a rumor about you at school, be very difficult to track that down. And it can be very hurtful, it can be very damaging. And that's why I say that one of the themes here is chaos. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through and I'm going to look for what that chaos actually looks like. I lay in bed all day and watch Grandma and Song Popo work around the house. I was too tired and too depressed to do any more than watch them and watch a patch of sunlight as it moved across the room. So, one of the unfortunate side effects is depression. And, as you're probably familiar, always with depression, there's anxiety. You get anxious, and so your body goes into fight or flight. Oh my gosh, we have to do something immediately right now. And then it swings to the other end of the spectrum, where you're too depressed to do anything at all. And people swing back and forth. Uh, it depends upon your common biology, psychological background and makeup. Uh, it depends on your circumstances, upon what you expect your circumstances to be. There's like a million things going on, obviously. I mean, I, from my various jobs, I've had to work on this stuff uh, with people. But I can tell you, though, that um, she gets anxious because she thinks about what people are saying to her, and so she gets depressed. And now that she's depressed and she has no control over it, she feels anxiety again. And that's what the theme here is. So even if you're struggling with themes of literature, simply stopping and saying, okay, you know, what's something happening right in front of me? Okay, she's sad. I know with depression goes anxiety. Simple information. And if you struggle in this class, or if you're having trouble engaging with this book, simply writing it down and then showing it to your teacher, your teacher can go, okay, they're making the effort. So. That's one of the reasons I really like this book, is that you can open up almost any portion of it, and you 
find something really moving, really incredible. Um, I really enjoyed her journey from sort of this very idealistic but very naive individual into a more mature young woman who uh, really changed uh, the world around her, at least in my opinion she did, because she wrote the book. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a challenge for today. Here's what this challenge goes as. All right, we talked about an outline. You can go ahead and take it all the way to the extreme. Do you wish you could build rockets? Traverse the worlds? Make billions of dollars? Whatever it is. What is some incredible feat that you wish you could accomplish? And don't you wish you could simplify it? Okay? So, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments below. But what is something, that's sort of your question for today, is what is something incredible you wish you could accomplish? with an outline. Alright, that's it.